When Germany invaded Poland in 1939, there were just over 800,000 members of the church worldwide. From the beginning of World War II, Latter-day Saints were involved in fighting for their countries. When the United States entered the war in 1941, the church saw an even greater number of its sons sent to battle. Along with many others, I was called to serve my country. By the end of the war, more than 100,000 Latter-day Saint men and women would serve on both sides of the conflict. The trials and experiences of the Latter-day Saint servicemen were similar in many ways to those of their fellow soldiers. They did, however, have singular experiences unique to members of the church as they endeavored to live the gospel in the midst of one of the greatest conflicts in history. These stories of courage and faith have inspired the generations that have come after them. Following are just a few of the experiences of some of the men who served. early Sunday morning. Over the radio it says, all citizens turn out your lights. This was December the 7th, 1941. Actually, it was two hours after they bombed us that they declared war. So it's a little bit like getting socked by the guy you're talking to without giving you a warning. They couldn't believe that Japan would do that to us, and so there was a tremendous feeling of patriotism and anxiety, I guess, too, but willingness to serve. Now, we didn't really know where Pearl Harbor was, but what we did know was that our country had been attacked. Well, immediately, us young people felt we should go to war, should go volunteer, and I did. The next morning, was a very historic time. Uh, all of the student body at uh, Arizona State at Tempe and all of the surrounding of cities came and we stood in front of the administration building with the flags flying and uh, patriotic music and then came the voice of our President Franklin Roosevelt. Now, I can't remember all of what he said, but his final words, which I couldn't quote exactly, but here is about what he said. No matter how long it takes, no matter how much treasure, no matter how many lives will be lost, we will fight on to ultimate victory. And I suppose that even President Roosevelt and probably no one else in the world realized just how long it would take, how much treasure we would spend, and how many lives would be lost. There were the usual extremes of opinion. Uh, one man on our street said he thought the war would be over in 90 days, that we would beat the Japanese, and my 4-H club advisor, I was a swineherd in those days, he took a more wise view. He said, this is going to last a long time, and that I could be in it. This was a war where uh, there was right and there was wrong. There was good and there was bad. Uh, it was sharply delineated, those that uh, they were doing terrible things, and terrible atrocities were committed by the, uh, the other side. And, uh, and so I knew that... Uh, you know, it's like the Book of Mormon. I mean, it's nothing but um, fighting for men's liberty and freedom. And it was clear to me that uh, this was something that we had to do. After Pearl Harbor, as in the United States, we were always on. We were on the defensive. We were always backing up, and the and the news was always gloomy because we had a 
we had a nation that was unprepared to be carrying on a war in, against Hitler and a war against Japan at the same time. I knew it was only a matter of time and I would be drafted. And I didn't want to get drafted. So I thought, well, I ought to join service. So I thought, well, I'll try to join the Marines. Interviewed for a mission when I was 19 or 20, but was not called. Joseph Fielding Smith interviewed me. And I thought, uh, when I was not called, I thought, what did I say wrong or what have I done wrong? And I uh, left California, went to Salt Lake and went to the missionary department, asked them uh, about my call. And I said, young man, we're not calling missionaries anymore. Join the army. So I went across the street and joined the army. I believe in being obedient. I didn't have any training from the Navy other than they gave me a, the handbook of Navy instructions, a book about this high, big three ring binder book. And I was to take a correspondence course in how to become a Navy officer without having anyone to even teach me how to salute. When we uh, got there, a sergeant came and took uh, the group of us over to meet the colonel, who was the commandant. And so we went over, and there he sat at his desk. And uh, the sergeant said to us, well, salute. Well, the only salute I ever knew was the Boy Scout salute. So here I came, <laughs> colonel. My Boy Scout salute, they were so disgusted with me. I remember the time before Hitler actually took power. Uh, he held meetings, and one day he was in our city of Chemnitz. And uh, my mother was a fervent believer in Hitler because he promised what the people wanted to hear. My mother and my sister used to go to these meetings, and Dad would always say, this is the beginning of the end. Now, he was a priesthood leader, and he knew the scriptures better than my mother did, you see. But he said, this was the beginning of the end. And I never forgot that. I bid my family goodbye at Treasure Island in San Francisco. We were in a seaplane. As I looked out of the, one of the little peepholes there in the tail of that plane, I thought one of the starboard engines was on fire. I had some wonderment as to whether uh, I would uh, really survive this war experience. But as I tossed and turned and watched that engine I thought was on fire, I did a lot of praying and soul searching. And uh, in my, in, in your growing up years and uh, when, when uh, Sometimes you would uh, not be as enthusiastic about some of those little church positions that you would be assigned to. And, and I decided that maybe my attitude hadn't been right. <laughs> and as I was going through the anguish of that flight and it, praying and uh, making a new commitment to my Heavenly Father, I committed that I would never have anything but in an enthusiastic approach to any church calling, and that it would have all of my attention and all of my heart and soul. But I made an interesting commitment on that flight. Uh, I didn't sleep very much. and. Uh, I've tried to live it ever since. I think a Latter-day Saint has the kind of an orientation that meeting together and expressing your faith, discussing it in a sometimes a ritualistic way, is the way you identify as being a member. When we were graduated, they sent us to Barksdale Field, Louisiana, in Shreveport. When we walked in, the man said, one of you guys, which one of you guys is Stuart? You've been asked for. 
the other six, seven weren't asked for, but Hugh Roper from Oak City, Utah, had been waiting for a LDS co-pilot, and that's how we got together at Shreveport and remained together until I got my airplane after 18 combat missions, and I named it Utah Man after my old college on the hill. One day, we were ordered into the commander's office, and they said, you're now going to go to Africa. You will go down there to bomb a target. We will cease operations here. And we took two, two days to fly down to Marrakesh the first day, and then across Africa and circled the base in the early morning. I said to myself, what is any Mormon boys? Well, I'll find them out. Name of my airplane, Utah Man. This guy came by and said, Utah? Who's from Utah? As he held his heart. Me, I'm from Salt Lake and Benjamin. He said, well, I'm from Ogden. I found there's another Latter-day Saint on the boat, and it was Sunday. We thought, well, what the heck? Why don't we have a, have a church service? And so what we did, we contacted the chaplain. He said, well, there's no place. There's only two of you. So he had a, ch he had a closet, and so he had his communion set there, and we said, well, can we use your communion set? And he said, sure. So we just went and closed the door, and here we are in a little room about four feet square, and we had a little sacrament meeting right there, right there on the boat because it had been quite a while since either of us had been to a formal meeting, but the idea of renewing our covenants was important. In the front lines, things were changing and new people coming in and out and so forth. So I really, uh, really all by myself. And, uh, but I did have one companion, and that is the church very wisely produced a very small version of this Book of Mormon. I mean, it's a whole Book of Mormon, but in, a, in small print. And I always had that stuck in my pack there. And so whenever there was a time when things were quiet and so forth, uh, I would read that. And that was my protection, spiritual protection, and uh, it was wonderful. I was there with, the, I didn't think any LDS, I bumped into one or two. And I said to them, would you join me if I wanted to hold the LDS service? Oh, go ahead and do it. At the first meeting, we had on the, the Sunday when I had prepared for the sacrament and so on, I had about 50 LDS soldiers show up. So there were five of us, and like one of them said, well, we got a, we got a branch president, two counselors, and a couple of clerks. We're just in business. <laughs> so we started to hold a sacrament meeting in, 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 in our tent, and I said, hey, you guys, there's no place to go in town. There's nothing to do here except three times a week we have a movie. Why don't we hold MIA on Tuesday night in my tent? And they said, well, nobody will come but us. And I said, well, I know nine nice young men, members of my crew. They will come or I'll make them clean their guns. So they said, good enough. So we started holding MIA on Tuesday night. Next Tuesday, they said, we want to have it Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Movies were Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So three times a week, and we couldn't hold it in the tent. They, filled the tent the second night we met. So we took tin cans. The Germans gassed their airplanes on five gallon honey can looking things. We get them around in a circle. And then we borrow the little organ from the chaplain. And we instead of sit around and sing a song, we'd sing LD hymns that, you know, we have hymns that the whole world knows. And they'd sing a hymn and then we'd, we'd, read, this, we'd read the new, they voted on going through the New Testament, which was a wonderful book to go through. One of the things the LDS chaplain did, Lyman Barrett, was to call a sacrament meeting. We sat on boxes and in a field and had the sacrament. But before that, we watched carefully to see who showed up because that would be our first understanding <clears throat> of who'd been killed or wounded among our buddies. And I watched for several in particular, including Dean Nielsen from Lindell, Utah, only to learn from one of his company members that he'd been killed. So there was a kind of roll call as people came over little hills to gather in this little spot for our sacrament meeting. There's a very sacred meeting and of course the, the, it was Saturday, July the 31st, 1943. We had been briefed all day. We knew exactly where we were gonna go. And we knew it'd be a, a, about a 13 hour mission. We would bomb the target from 50 feet and we, we would have, of course, no fighter protection. We'd have all kinds of enemy. And we were told it was the heaviest defended place in all Europe except Berlin. And so they had to guard that place. And we were to go over there that next day. So it was my turn. That, it was a Saturday night. And I, they wanted to know if we are going to hold our meeting. And I said, well, we won't unless we 
Uh, we will if we can, but we don't know. And sure enough, by five o'clock or so, things were ready, so they, we all held our little meeting. We surrounded and sang the hymn and had the prayer. And about, instead of 45 guys, there were about that many standing in the back that had just heard about our little meeting and they wanted to know more. And it was, had me, we took turns taking charge. This was my night to take charge. And a guy standing back there, a lieutenant, and he said, no, I was reaching for my Bible. We were about, I said, I think we're about the 10th chapter of Matthew. That's as far as we got, because they, they just want to talk about the things in the scriptures. And so he said, no, I don't want to read the Bible tonight. I want to know one thing. If I get shot down tomorrow, where will I be tomorrow night? And like one man, they said, yeah, Lieutenant, tell us. So I put the Bible back and I took a hold of the triple combination. I said, this scripture in this book tells me the answer to your question. We were told in the plan of salvation that we would be able to come to a place, live, and follow a series of rules. And if we do it properly, we would be able to come back and live with him. And I said, it's a marvelous thing to know that you can, you can, you can live properly now and, be, and then go back into the kingdom of God. And if you get shot down tomorrow, you'll be just as alive. You're eternal. You are eternal. And if you get shot down tomorrow, you'll be just as alive tomorrow night as you are now. And he says, thanks, good night. That's what I want to hear. And he was shot down, and I never saw him again. I met very few members of the church in this operation that I was in, very few of them. That I was usually a loner in there, but, but I'd have an opportunity in associating with them would be to let them know how good a 7-Up is. Everybody knew that I was a Mormon, and they were very happy about it because uh, in the Air Corps, uh, after every uh, flight, combat flight, you'd come down and you were issued two ounces of liquor. Well, I was very happy to have that because it soon mounted up and I could get a quart here and there and I could trade it for anything. They would give me anything I wanted just for a quart of whiskey. Maybe I should have poured it out, I don't know, but I didn't. <laughs> we were regarded with amusement or suspicion but when we got out and circulated around like, you know, I was a little odd because I didn't smoke or drink or chase women, didn't even drink coffee, they found out I was a, not a bad guy. And I think, I think it became quite generally known. And I think after the war, it took some of the prejudice away and, and I think it uh, helped give the opportunity for the church to become well known and expand. I did talk to some of the fellows that I was serving with about the church, uh, especially one who was also a sergeant, uh, and he was a brute. He was about two heads taller than I was and six feet wide and uh, mean as can be. I talked to him about the gospel and he laughed at me and he made fun of me ever since. I stood my ground. I never tried to tell him any more about it because he always made fun of me in front of the others. Funny thing is when we were in France, we were pushed out of Cain, house to house fighting. And I was one of the last ones, was about 10, 12 others, and all of a sudden to the side of me, I hear, help me, help me. And there he was sitting, this big old bully, sitting in a doorway. And he was shot in the leg and he couldn't walk anymore. Please, don't leave me here. And I went over there and I grabbed him, put him over my shoulder and carried him out. And you know what he said? Oh God, oh God, help me. This is what you see in war. All of a sudden, when you're in deep trouble that you can't find a way out anymore, there is God. God that he denied, that he made fun of. I was sorely tempted to leave him there, but I didn't do it. Your religion was to be stamped on the dog tag. You had C for Catholic, P for Protestant, J for Jewish, 
And uh, some of them want to left blank if they didn't have a religious preference. But for all the LDS boys, they, they put P for Protestant. Well, President Grant talked to the Army officials, explained to them we were not Protestant, and asked that our dog tags be stamped LDS. Well, they issued me some new dog tags, but they left the L off. And I got dog tags labeled DS. Well, that opened up lots of discussions. What does that stand for? I said, divine soul. He said, no, designated sacrifice. In fact, it opened up more interesting discussions than it would have been if it had been <laughs> stamped correctly, I think. One Sunday, a fellow came to us and he said, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I don't have any bad habits. I don't smoke, I don't drink, and I pay my tithing to my mother. She pays the tithing to our church. And I'd like to study with you. I said, oh, that's great. And this Seventh-day Adventist fellow said, after the third meeting, he said, I'd like to join your church. I'd like to be baptized. <laughs> baptized? <laughs> you know, <laughs> we didn't have any authority. I was elected because I got the books. I guess they finally elected me as the presiding elder. But, you know, the uh, uh, question was, should we be baptizing? The talk, should we be baptizing? We're, we hold the priesthood. And some said, yeah, you ought to baptize him. Some said, no. Most of them said, yes, you should. They talked about it back and forth, and finally, I guess it was my decision, since I had been elected the presiding elder, I said, well, why don't you study with us? And if you still believe when you get back, you'll even be a better member. And jumping forward, he did come back. His mother and father lives in Missouri. And he called, went up to, up to Independence, talked to missionaries, and he came down and they were he was baptized on his father's farm in Little Creek. The fact that you have some commitment, some things that you believe in, opens, it's easy to open the doors if they find that you're a normal individual out in this world attempting to do good for mankind, it opens a lot of doors. That first presidency statement, I think it's 1942, was very pivotal with me and it was in the little tan or brown booklet about when we're called by our country to serve that we did not need to feel we were under some great guilt for uh, being engaged in war. We saw two German soldiers come across the bridge and start up the street. There was, the snow was quite deep on the ground and they would go into each house as they came up the street. The civilians had all been evacuated from the town and we assumed that they had been sent on a patrol to see if there were any Americans in this town. So Paul went down the stairs and they approached the door and he opened the door and stepped out with his gun and told them, Honda Hoch, which is in German, hands up. Well, one of them immediately dropped his gun and raised his hands and the other one reached around, he had his rifle on a sling and he reached around for his rifle and started to bring it up and so we shot him. Well when that happened the other one turned around and started running as fast as he could down that street. I had a, a 30 caliber carbine and so I we didn't want him to get away because now they would know that where the Americans were in that town so I aimed right between his shoulders and shot. He kept running and I shot again and he fell. I thought I'd hit him, but I guess he just slipped in the snow because he jumped up right away and started running again. When you get another human being in the crosshairs of a rifle and you know as soon as you pull that trigger, a life's gonna be taken, whether it's someone's son or husband or father. I mean, boy, that, I mean, it comes to you. What am I doing here? Why am I here? Why do I have to kill that man? There they were, five Germans. Machine guns there, they'd have been the ones who were killing us. And myself and then a couple of other buddies came up. 
and we could shoot them, we could kill them, but we didn't. We took them prisoner. And some of them were looked like 15 years old, 17 years old, something like that. I couldn't do it. And I fired three more times right in that same spot, right between his shoulders. And he kept running and got down almost to the bridge, and he went around behind the house, probably a little over 50 feet down the street on the the gate post of the house was a little fancy ornament, so I raised my carbine up and shot and just hit it right dead center. And uh, I knew that it wasn't me. About that time, we looked up the street, and here came the patrol up the street. And our German friend was in front of them with his hands up in the air. And Nettleton said, hey, Hall, we found a friend of yours down there. <laughs> Said, what do you mean a friend of mine? Well, when we found him, he was down behind a house on his knees praying. And, and you're the only guy we've ever seen doing that, so we thought you must know each other. And one of them jokingly said, tell him that he's real lucky because Hall's dead-eyed dick, a cowboy from Arizona. And he said, oh, my family have a very good friend in Mesa, Arizona. Elder Max Webb, a missionary that baptized my family when I was a little boy. And uh, when he said that, why, Hines, our interpreter, said, well, Hall's a Mormon, too. And his eyes brighten up, and he goes, oh, Bruder Hall. How many of these others are members of the church that I shoot at? It was a terrible feeling. I'm shooting at a brother of mine. And so whenever I had a chance, I would, I would shoot, but I didn't aim very good. Maybe I, I was the reason why we lost the war. Who knows? <laughs> Another thing that they asked him, said, ask him what he was praying for, praying that he wouldn't be killed. He said, oh, no, I prayed for that to, before we crossed the bridge this morning. When your men found me, I was thanking my Father in heaven that I hadn't been killed when I was running down the street. After he had left, I was kind of sorry that I hadn't told him that he had uh, really strengthened my testimony of prayer. It was hot up in the island and I had my men, and there was a little ravine down below there. It was all shaded and cool. And oh, it was a lovely place to go down into. And when we were there, I had a terrible feeling. It says, get out of there. And I took my men. I says, come on, this is no place for us. Let's go. So I took them up, up there in the sunshine again. Now, oh, they complained but they were up high enough to look down into the ravine. And it wasn't long before they saw mortar shells landing down where we were. And I says, look it, aren't we glad we're up here now? <laughs> that voice, I've heard it before. I didn't hesitate one minute. I know that I should have been dead many times during the war. I should have been killed many times. We came out of Russia when I joined that special unit, and there were only 12 left from our company. I mean, you know, it could have been me. But Dad had given me a blessing that I would make it through the war, and I would come home. We were all lined up, uh, more or less alphabetical order, and all of a sudden they took me out of this lineup. And I wondered why, and I still wonder why to this day. And put me in another lineup and still went, went loaded on the ships. Well, when we were going across the ocean up to the Philippines, that ship that I was, uh, would have been on was sank. A torpedo hit it where most of the personnel went underwater in three seconds. There was only three or four people that lived out of that. And the miracle of it is, if that torpedo had hit the ship that I was on, 
had only missed it by two or three feet, I wouldn't have been here today. I'm alive today because of what the Lord did for us at that time. Because I could have either been wounded or killed if we had stayed in that ravine. I was so thankful. And I remember the lieutenant watching their watches, and then when it hit 8 o'clock, they said, Charge! And up the hill we went, and there was machine gun fire from on top coming down, just spraying us. And, and the snow was about 14 inches deep, and so we were trudging through there. And right on my side was my buddy, he was about 29 years old, married three children from Georgia. Not a member of the church, but a good man. And so we were running as fast as we could because we knew that it was really important that we get at the top as quickly as possible or we would never make it at all. And about halfway up, I heard him gurgle something happen. And I looked, and he had a hole right in the middle of his forehead. And he went right down in the snow. But I couldn't stop I, as I saw him go down. And um, I thought, why him? He's got a wife, he's got three children. I don't have anybody other than my parents at home. Why did he get it, not me? Robert Flake came to Italy, just about as devoted a Latter-day Saint as I recall meeting. He flew four or five missions and then was killed. I wrote to his parents at his death, telling them that I knew him well and how what a wonderful young man he was. And uh, they wrote back. And they couldn't believe that the Lord would let him die because they too knew that the Lord would protect him. I didn't understand that there's what I call the great transfer board in the sky and the Lord runs it and he determines who's released and not released. I had to deal with it at a more primitive level in which indeed you do see uh, what seems to be randomness in people dying and being wounded. I was able to return home in safety. I was no more worthy than countless thousands of others, LDS and others. And I had to ask myself why. And there's no answer. The only... <clears throat> The only answer that I can give to myself is that I know that in the eternal scheme of things, the Lord will make all things right. Our job was to uh, hold the German advance up while the rest of the troops were able to withdraw safely. Joe and I dug a two-man foxhole. We got in, down in there and got a little more comfortable. And Joe says, uh, you're Christian? I said, yes. He says, what church you belong to? I says, I'm a Mormon. He said, do they believe in God? And I said, yes, very much so. He said, do you know how to pray? I said, yes, I grew up all my life knowing how to pray. He says, will you pray? So the two of us knelt in that cramped foxhole, and I tried to think of what I should say to the Lord. And while I was thinking, Joe nudged me in the ribs, and he says, don't forget to mention, we didn't enlist, we were drafted. I tried to pray regularly when we were in a barracks. Uh, when the lights went out, I'd kneel by the side of my bunk. And when we were over in combat, I'd try to uh, find a secluded spot. Sometimes it was hard, and I would kneel down to pray. When I couldn't find a, a secluded spot to kneel, I would just uh, say a, a real quick silent prayer standing up. I had a Polish friend that would make great fun of me 
If I would say a prayer anywhere he could see me, he would always have some crack or joke or comment to make, uh, trying to belittle me, and it didn't bother me in the slightest. But I noticed when you're in that little assault boat, just before they kicked the three of us out, here's my poet friend back there, praying like fury. And I tapped him on the shoulder, and I says, you're too late. You should have been praying six months ago so they would send you to Hawaii in the training group. We were going back up to our tent, and I said to my crew, all you guys, say your prayers tonight. We need all the help we can get, please. And I don't care what religion you belong to. You believe in God, say your prayers. And my big bombardier, Ralph Cummings, he says, Skipper, you're on the right frequency. Pray for us. <laughs> and I just gave an ordinary prayer that anyone in Latter-day Saint would give. And those, those nine guys, we just like a football team, shook hands with each other, and we all said, we're coming back tomorrow. I felt the feeling of the Spirit with those guys, just as I would do with my, a bunch of my mission companions. The Japanese had tried to shell our little mortar position, which was on a little plateau, and in order to do that, they had to clear the, a little hill in front of us, which meant that their shells were going just beyond us into a little uh, valley. But they must have moved their artillery pieces because they they found the range and uh, a shell lit two or three feet from my hole uh, one evening and they proceeded to do what we called triangulating and they should have then fired for effect because they had finally gotten us but I am sure along with others prayed hard and the shelling stopped when there was no logical reason for it to stop after they'd made so many efforts to get to us. I felt protected, as did, I'm sure, the other men in that situation. They had chased us and chased us up the trees and down the trees and attacked from the left and tanks from the right and, and you run and you run and I was in top shape, but I was laying there and I said, should I shoot myself? I was ready to give up. I, I just couldn't take it anymore. I was laying behind a big tree and I said, you know, just get this misery over with. This is awful. But then I remember Dad's blessing that I would come back and I said, well, I've got to take that. The good was the bad and the bad was the good. And uh, word of prayer and I could go on. It's really a lifesaver. Prayer is a lifesaver. No question about it. My only surviving aunt said that sometime in May of 45, she doesn't remember the day, that mother had told her the next day that she and dad had prayed usual vocal parental prayer and included me, of course, and what sisters I had by then. But that then they got in bed and uh, began to go to sleep, and mother said, Clarence, we've got to get out and pray again. Neil is in grave danger. And so they got out of bed, prayed again for me. I don't know which day, but I rather imagine giving time zones and all of that, that it would have probably been when that artillery shelling occurred at its worst stage. And the phrase that comes to mind from the Book of Mormon about some other young men who went off to war and their mothers, as you know, is we do not doubt our mothers knew it. I don't have any doubt that my mother knew intuitively that they needed to pray. And that kind of parenting is what, even after all these years, I hope our young men and women experience because uh, they will be at times in grave danger too. We were flying at 27,000 feet when the instrument panel exploded in our face. We had been hit directly, a direct flak hit. And our aircraft exploded within the plane and the plane became unflyable and uh, 
I was told to be the first to go down and, and to bail out. They come to the edge of the forest, and all of a sudden there were three soldiers looking at me. Two of them were kneeling, one was standing, and they had rifles pointed at this noise that was coming out of the forest. And believe me, when I saw those rifle ends, the opening of the barrel, they were this big. We received a broadcast a radio message from General Wainwright uh, asking all the armed forces in the Philippines to surrender for the sake of those, sake of those on Bataan and Cregidor. The Japanese had all the military, the high-ranking military in Malinta Tunnel on Cregidor and was going to, threatening to kill them if they didn't order all the armed forces to surrender. I had to pull that rip card. They told us in, in our training, it said that it doesn't mean a thing if you don't pull the string. So I pulled it and it opened. I turned a few times and reached down and unzipped my heavy flying boots because they're hard to swim in. And uh, about that time, this fighter, this German fighter came at me straight at me. I thought he was going to shoot me. He turned sideways like that, went past me. So close to my face, I could see, I could see his face. And he went on and never fired a shot. He saluted and went on. The German tugboat uh, pulled us out of the water. Uh, they used big, long grappling hooks to pull us out because our clothing was wet and we were quite heavy. They pulled me in. He said, for you, the war is over. Our first thought was, we won't surrender. We'll take off to the jungles and uh, fight the Japanese as guerrillas rather than surrender. And then we got to thinking about maybe the Filipinos would probably turn us into the Japanese for a few pesos, you know. And so we felt like, well, Maybe the thing to do would be to surrender. The Americans will be back through here in a month, maybe two, three at the most. Little did we. Realize what lay ahead of us. I think if we had known, I think we wouldn't have surrendered. They put us on ships, and some of us, and we went to the States. And believe me, it was something else when I drove into the New York Harbor and I saw the Statue of Liberty. What a feeling. Oh, it was unbelievable. What a feeling. The feeling of freedom that came over me, you know, personally. And then they put us on a train, a square wheel train, to go across Germany, and we ended up in Stalaglu III in Sagan, Germany, which was then occupied Poland. As I was looking through the compound for a familiar looking face, there was a British uh, uh, pastor who was standing on a tree stump giving a sermon. And just as I passed him, he made a comment about uh, if our Father in Heaven knows when a sparrow falls to the ground, don't you think he would know when it be 24 falls to the ground. We started looking around and I found out that there were seven LDS fellows that I had found. And we uh, thought that'd be a good idea if we'd get together and, and, and meet and study. All the time I was in Italy, I never attended a, an LDS service. It was not until I was a prisoner that I had that opportunity. We were the only ones that could hold a meeting by ourselves and have the priesthood and be able to partake of the sacrament without having to depend on the Germans because we had bread and water available to us. We had the sacrament. And I don't remember what we had for, for bread. I can't remember what we used. Maybe some rice balls. <laughs> the sacrament was interesting because I'd always had to uh, uh, use white bread for the sacrament. They'd break up the white bread and they didn't have any white bread there. And we uh, discussed it and said, oh, what difference does it make? You know, it's a, rep it's a representation, so we finally used black bread for the sacrament. It was uh, uh, about 20% sawdust, and so I'm not sure how acceptable that was for the sacrament, but we used it anyway. In January of 1945, the Russians were approaching our camp. As a matter of fact, they were so close we could hear the small arms fire. 
And the Germans were concerned that uh, the Russians would liberate us, and so they moved us to, a, to another camp. So it was in the dead of winter. It was about 8 o'clock at night. On the, I think it was about the 27th of January that they came into our room and said that we had to be ready to march uh, within an hour. We broke the trail through about six inches of snow and in the face of the blizzard and then the other followed us. The line of, of POWs that night stretched across about 20 miles. But as we made our way through uh, this village, an old woman stepped out of the crowd and she fell into step with me and while we were walking along together, she put her hand in my pocket and I had no idea what she had deposited there because after all, she was the enemy. And then after she took her hand out of my pocket, she faded back into the crowd again. And so very gingerly, I put my hand in my pocket and found a small round object, took it out, it was a potato. And I didn't wait to wash it, I ate it immediately. All the time in, while in prison camp, uh, a real enemy was, was not the Japanese soldiers, but it was the loss of hope, loss of faith, giving up. When you give up, then that seemed to be the end for a lot of the fellows. My parents were notified after I was captured about two months later that I was missing in action. So they didn't know whether I was dead or whether I was just missing in action. And the greatness of my dad again, they were all crying and, and uh, all down. Uh, he was crying too, but he said to my mother and my sister, the Lord give us and the Lord take us away. Praise be the name of the Lord. One day at work, I had decided I, I couldn't make it anymore. I felt like I had had all I could take. I went to the guard and told him I wasn't going to work anymore. And they kind of beat you up. But I couldn't feel anything. They took me back to the barracks. And I laid there on my bunk, thinking about all that was happening and, and thinking that I just felt like I couldn't go on anymore. I felt like some of the others that had given up. And then I got to thinking about a patriarchal blessing that my grandfather had given me years and years ago that I had been able to keep with me all this time. And I got it out, and I had a picture of my mother and my father. And I got that out, and I read my patriarchal blessing over and over again. And then uh, the feeling came over me. To hang on just a little longer. If I could do that, that I would maybe be able to live long enough that we could be free again. The first indication that uh, the war was coming to an end was that P-38 fighters were flying over and we could hear the uh, war uh, being conducted in the, in the village. The little steeple in the town of Mosberg had a big tall flagpole on it, had a big black swastika there. Came slowly down. American flag went up to the top of the pole. I looked around and saw men I knew were tough. Tears streaming on their face. Just to see the American flag.
I remember when the European conflict ended, these machine guns went off and we were scared they were going to shoot us because they were celebrating so hard. <laughs> it was really quite a celebration. You think 4th of July has a lot of noise? You ought to have heard the noise that took place there. And all of a sudden, the commotion that started shooting in the air, flares and tracers and uh, concussion grenades are going off all around the thing. I'm sure the Germans over there expecting all heck to break loose on them tomorrow. Wonder what in the devil are those drunk Americans doing on the other side of that river? They radioed to us on the island and says the war is over. Boy, were we happy. Here came a jeep across the field, across the ramp, waving a red light, a red lantern. And I said, to oh boy, what have we done now? They usually fly and flash a red light from the tower, but here's he coming. We're in trouble, what have we done? What have we done? And I'd look back like this, and there was the, the door, and the red light came through first, and the face said, cut your engines, the, show, the war just ended. And three months later, when I was still on that base, that B-29 was still sitting there. They wouldn't let you taxi, it was too expensive. A fellow came up to me. And he was kind of fidgeting around. He said, uh, Johnny, he said, you cost me some money. I said, what are you talking about? He says, I, he says, you didn't know it, but we had a bet. Before this war was over, you'd be drinking and smoking and taking advantage of every woman you could. And he says, nobody's ever seen you do it. And he says, I lost my bet. I've got to pay up. I says, I'm sorry that you lost money. He says, you know, it was worth it. He says, it got anything to do with being a Mormon? I says, it got everything to do with being a Mormon. The war affected my spiritual life in that I knew, you know, this was after it was over, that Father in Heaven had made a decision that I would be protected in spirit. And I was forever grateful to him for this. I knew that. My spirit sort of came together and I, I kind of knew who I was, and I knew where I was going, and, I, uh, and I'd had a chance to see terrible things, but things which uh, kept reaffirming that the gospel is true. As I look back on the entire military experience, I realize what a profound um, influence it has had on my life. The horror of conflict, the gratefulness that I have for the life that I've been able to live, the thankfulness I have to my Heavenly Father for His kindness to me, the deepened patriotism that I feel for my country, my beloved country. I remember my grandmother who walked across the plains as a young girl, and as I stood at her knees when I was a young boy, she pat me on the head. She would said, make the most of everything, make the most of everything. And that's what we did. We made the most of a bad experience and made a positive experience out of it. I feel I'm a better man because of that experience. I've, I've endured hardship. I've, I've been hungry like I'd never been hungry before. I've been exhausted to the point where you felt like crying. I've been cold and your feet were frozen. All of these experiences we endured, we survived and the knowledge of who we were and the strength that we gained from just having faith was, was wonderful. It, it, it carried us through. As I have reflected back upon what I was asked to do in the military, um, sometimes I hesitate to even talk about it because uh, the opportunity was so great. The opportunity to give needed service to 
uh, pay an almost unpayable debt doesn't come to everyone. Or maybe we should say we don't take opportunity to repay that debt. And I'm speaking of the debt that we owe to a mother who gives us birth and, who's, and parents who, who raise us with love and care, to the church that uh, guides our lives, and then to our country that offers us freedom and protection. And so I was always grateful that I could give complete service to my country, which opportunity came and was thrust upon me and countless others suddenly on December 7th, 1941. I've often said I wouldn't want to take a million dollars for the experiences I've had, but I wouldn't give 40 cents to do it again. My first home teaching companion when I moved back from New Hampshire, we spent 25 years in New Hampshire, was a German fighter pilot. And uh, he was quite uncomfortable with the idea. And we knelt and had a prayer. And uh, from then on, we became good friends. But it was interesting. He, we were over there bombing his country, and he was up there trying to shoot us down. And then here we were, home teaching companions. That can only happen in the church. The stories of the Latter-day Saints who served during World War II need to be preserved for future generations. Brigham Young University has created an archive to do this. If you or someone you know are one of the many members of the church who served their country during World War II, either at home or abroad, please contact the Saints at War Project. For more information, call us at 801-422-2820, visit our website at www.saintsatwar.org, or write to us at 375 JSB, BYU, Provo, Utah, 84602.